Hi, everybody. Welcome. Um, I'm going to talk for just a minute about Northampton Neighbors, the organization sponsoring this speaker series, and then we'll turn to the main event of the day. Um, Northampton Neighbor, Neighbors launched in 2017 to help people who live in Northampton who are 55 years and older age in place. That is to lead full and independent lives. We're part of an international movement. We're a village. There are villages all over the world at this point. Um, and uh, we have about 900 members. Um, and we provide a range of services, although with COVID, we've had to go, of course, online for our services. And so we provide now phone calls for companionship, intergenerational messaging, and of course, other things. And the speaker series, and we've just started to provide in-person services again, like yard work. So uh, welcome. Um, and so now let's get to the main event. Let me tell you a little bit about logistics. Um, your mics are going to be muted throughout the talk by Nina Kleinberg, who most of you saw. She's our um, volunteer technical advisor, who has been incredible in this organization, um, and she can answer questions about Zooming. And now to the main event, which is Jerry Epstein, who is the speaker. Uh, first, thank you, Jerry. This is great that you're doing this. Um, we're, we are more than honored to have you. Jerry is a professor of economics at the University of Massachusetts and co-director of the Political Economy Research Institute, what is known as PERI. Um, he was educated at Swarthmore. He told me not to say all this stuff, but I'm saying it anyway. And educated at Princeton, where he got his PhD. He's won many awards and written many articles and many books about financialization, which has become a major concept that he introduced in economics and other fields, financial crises and approaches to central banking, to name just a few of his topics. He's worked with a number of UN agencies and contributed for many years to the Center for Popular Economics. Pre-COVID, he was always jetting off someplace to meet with world leaders and give talks. And sometimes he stayed for months, even for a year, uh, to, to be a visiting scholar, whether in France, China, Italy, Senegal. Uh, he's a well-traveled scholar. But now he does most of his work online, including a recent piece you can all see on the American Prospect. Um, they, they did a roundtable where they introduced, I think, four or five, what they call distinguished progressive economists economist, of which he is one, um, talking about the inequalities produced by COVID. Um, I could go on and on, um, but I won't because you probably want to hear him instead of me. What you can do is Google him and find thousands of links to his work, at, which I hope you'll want to do after you hear his talk. Um, today he's going to give a talk called, well he has a sheet showing the name of the talk, so welcome Jerry. I want to thank all of you for, for coming. I, I really uh, appreciate it. I'm going to share my screen with you now, um, and then uh, about 20 minutes from now, we'll come back and, and uh, take questions, uh, and hopefully I'll be able to provide some, some answers. Um, right, so um, let's see, just get my chat thing up, okay. So the name of my talk is The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly, the Federal Reserve and Government Financial Response to the COVID uh, crisis. Um, this crisis that we're happy, having now follows just 10 years uh, after the great financial crisis of 2007 and 2009. And in many ways, these two crises are very different. Uh, the crisis of, of 2007 2000 to 2009, it started in the financial sector and spread out uh, from there to the rest of the economy. Of course, that was caused by corrupt and reckless behavior by uh, Wall Street banks and, and investors. And it was facilitated by government officials, uh, both Republican, um, the, the two Bushes, and Democrat, uh, Bill Clinton. And it was really helped along by uh, the libertarian head of the Federal Reserve, Alan Greenspan, an acolyte of uh, Ayn Rand, who uh, didn't believe in government regulation of anything, much less the banks. So as the waves of crisis emanated from the financial sector, eventually it caused massive foreclosures, unemployment, and a decade of relatively slow economic growth. 
This time, 10 years later with the COVID crisis, the crisis did not begin in the financial sector, but it began as a health crisis. And the economic crisis radiated uh, from that, from people stopping uh, traveling, going to restaurants, and eventually the government um, shut down a lot, of, uh, a lot of economic activity. But importantly, there's kind of a, a convergence between these two crises in the following sense. Um, this time around, um, after the uh, cutbacks, uh, Wall Street melted down. Finance had a major crisis, um, just as it had in 2007, 2009. And so once again, ten, within 10 years, the Federal Reserve was faced with the second crisis of what to do about um, a Wall Street that was uh, threatening to burn down the house. Um, plus it was facing a major economic crisis at the same time. So these two uh, episodes converged on Wall Street as so much does. And the question is why and who needs that from Wall Street? Now to address the financial uh, meltdown, Jerome Powell, currently the chair of the Fed, announced in March that the Federal Reserve would do, quote, whatever it takes to protect the financial system. Notice he didn't say, we'll do whatever it takes to protect the economy, to protect um, people and, 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 and households and livelihoods, but uh, we'll do whatever it takes to protect the financial system. And so far, the Federal Reserve, the Federal Reserve has, uh, has um, pledged to spend at least four trillion four trillion dollars, that's not million, that's not billion, four trillion dollars um, uh, on, on this task of protecting Wall Street um, and expanding it to some of the rest of the economy, which I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, and economists expect that it's likely to spend even more, maybe double that, maybe more. And here's one of the key messages of my, of my talk. Uh, just as it did in the great financial crisis of 2007, 2009, the Federal Reserve uh, has either been forced to or has chosen to provide a massive bailout to Wall Street and has, relatively speaking, provided only pennies, only pennies to millions of Americans who are in deep, deep trouble. It has promised to permanently take care of Wall Street, that is, do whatever it takes, and has offered only small, temporary help to everyone else. An angry mantra after the great financial crisis was the Federal Reserve bailed out Wall Street and left Main Street to fend for itself. Elizabeth Warren and many other people said that, including the Tea Party. And unfortunately, so far, the same can be said uh, this time around. The anger last time helped to elect Donald Trump. We wonder what the anger this time is likely uh, to do. I will reserve, uh, return to the Federal Reserve in a minute, but first I want to discuss the second of the government macroeconomic policies. Um, oh no, actually, let me, let me spend a few more minutes on uh, the Federal Reserve. So the Federal Reserve, what has it done? It's bought up billions of dollars of financial assets in order to save Wall Street. And when it buys these financial assets, it boosts, it increases their, their values, their prices. Now, most of these assets are owned by the wealthy and by corporations. So on this graph, you can see uh, the red line, which is, this is from 2008 to 2020, the current period. The red line represents consumer confidence. That's on the right-hand side. And you can see the consumer confidence plummeted when the crisis hit. However, the stock price index, Standard & Poor's 500, it came down temporarily and then it went back up. Why? Because the Federal Reserve said we will do whatever it takes and has spent uh, millions and, or billions of dollars um, uh, buying these assets. And this helps people who own assets, which is primarily the wealthy, but, but not necessarily many others. Now let's move um, to fiscal policy. Fiscal policy is tax and government spending policy. Uh, here we have to distinguish between the fiscal policy of the federal government, um, which uh, has to be passed by Congress and, and signed into law uh, by the president, and 
fiscal policy by the states and cities and other locales like Massachusetts and Northampton. Now a key difference, there are two key differences here. One, states and locales spend, provide most of the services that we depend on, police, fire, education, health, so forth. But second of all, and very relevant here, is that states and locales mostly have to balance their budget, especially on current, current expenditure like salaries and payments to teachers, um, nurses, et cetera. Whereas the federal government can run a, a major a budget deficit, that is it can spend a lot more than it takes in in taxes. So that means the constraints on this government sector that is so important to, to our livelihoods is, is very tight whereas on the federal government, um, it is not. So as you can imagine, uh, with the COVID crisis and, um, and uh, a, a cut in tax revenue for the federal government, uh, the federal budget has gotten large. And in fact, the federal government has taken unprecedented measures in trying to um, uh, uh, improve the economy in this situation. Uh, they've spent <clears throat> over $3 trillion and chances are they're gonna be spending um, a lot more. Now, this great expenditure uh, in, by the federal government um, is, is going to lead to a major increase in the budget deficit and in the total debt that the government has to uh, borrow um, uh, over the next uh, five to 10 years. And indeed, um, if we look at this, this is the debt uh, which is the dark line, and the net interest payments as a share of gross domestic product from 1940 uh, to 2019, and I'm projecting it up here to 2020. You can see that the debt is projected as a share of GDP to be just as high as it was at the, during the Second World War, over 100% of GDP. Now, People are asking, is this, um, is this out of control? What's gonna be the impact of this massive uh, increase in, in government expenditure? Well, some people say, well, one impact is gonna be a big increase of, of all of these policies is gonna be an increase uh, in inflation. But in fact, um, we have to think about what causes inflation. And the major thing that causes inflation is when uh, demand for goods and services are greater than the supply, are greater than the capacity of the country to produce um, uh, these goods and services. And most economists believe that inflation is not gonna be a problem. Why? Because we're in a big recession. Um, and in a big recession, we're not utilizing a lot of the capacity for production that we have. This is the capacity utilization rate, total industry. And you can see it's plummeted to about 65% uh, of what it, um, uh, whereas it typically is 80 or 90%. Uh, so we have plenty of capacity to produce more stuff. Um, the problem is more likely going to be a deflation. That is prices are gonna fall because we have an excess supply of most products. Now this isn't true of all products. We know that there are some prices that are going up like for toilet paper or hand sanitizer, uh, or surgical masks, et cetera. But overall, when you're in a recession bordering on um, perhaps a depression, uh, we expect prices to fall, not to go up. So inflation is not likely to be a problem anytime soon. Uh, this is another measure of the same thing where the Federal Reserve expects uh, the inflation rate to be, be down close to, to uh, half a percentage point for the next year or more. What about interest rates? We think about when the government is borrowing a lot of money, um, that that's uh, creating a lot of, uh, um, that's absorbing a lot of, of the money that people have to lend. But in fact, um, interest rates have been falling dramatically, uh, partly because of Federal Reserve action, and it, um, it's expected to stay close to, uh, to zero for a while. Why is that? It's because, the United States provides the world's currency, the US dollar. And what that means is that 
businesses and households and governments all over the world want to hold dollars. So they're throwing money at us. They want to lend us money uh, because, uh, especially when there's a crisis, they want to hold more and more dollars. So we can borrow from the rest of the world uh, almost for free at very low interest rates. And so that's why you see uh, this diagram here, the net interest payment on um, government securities, uh, it's going way down even as the debt is going up because our interest rates are falling so low, partly because there's an economic crisis and partly because the Federal Reserve is keeping interest rates so low. What about the argument that in running such a big deficit, we're pushing the burden onto our children and grandchildren. They're the ones who are going to have to pay all this back. And therefore, running a deficit like this is a terrible idea. Well, here's the thing, and this is the, another, a second key point. We not only leave our children debts, but we also leave them assets. The question is, what kind of assets are we leaving them with the government expenditure that we're providing? Are we leaving them better schools, healthier um, uh, uh, healthcare systems, safer jobs, a cleaner environment? Um, or are we leaving them basically nothing? Are we throwing away this money, giving it to rich people and corporations and oil companies and therefore we're not leaving any real assets to our children. So to me, the major issue is not the debt per se. The major issue is what we're doing with the money that we're borrowing and are we using it to provide productive and useful and healthy assets for, for, our, for our children and grandchildren. So where has the government spent its money? Well, this diagram is, I think, a little hard to read, um, but it, it tracks uh, the different uh, coronavirus expenditure bills. Um, first bill, second bill, third bill. The fourth bill is the one recently passed by Congress, the HEROES bill, but that hasn't been implemented and the Senate isn't even gonna take it up. So you can forget about um, the lighter color line. Um, so uh, testing public health is only this much, state and local government only that much. Uh, most of it is for business, big corporations, um, and yes, some individuals, it's important. Unemployment insurance is very important, um, plus the $1,200 checks has been somewhat important. Um, and so-called small business, but a lot of these small businesses are actually pretty big businesses that receive the, these funds. So, um, so far it's not looking too great in terms of where the money is going. Um, a lot of it's been going to corporations, big business, and so forth, with no strings attached, without saying you have to uh, em keep employing your workers or you have to provide uh, healthy um, uh, masks and, and working conditions for your workers. None of that uh, has been uh, implemented or imposed. So on the other side then, who's bearing the brunt of the crisis? Well, this diagram shows income losses are more pronounced among low-income households. These, this is a graph uh, of the uh, four months in May. Down here are those making less than $25,000 a year. Um, up here are those making $200,000 or more a year. Um, and um, so you can see income losses are higher uh, among the poor. Um, uh, uh, going all the way up to 200,000 a year. But among the poor, and there are whites and, and blacks and Hispanics and others among the poor, uh, black workers have been particularly affected, as we all know. Um, they represent 17% uh, of the frontline workers, whereas in the population, they only represent 12%. Uh, Black workers are less likely to have paid sick days and less likely to be able to work from home than white workers. <clears throat> this is um, black workers, 58 uh, paid sick days um, on average, white workers, 66. 
could work from home, black workers 20%, white workers almost 30%. So um, uh, the poor and um, uh, the minorities, especially black workers, uh, um, are particularly being impacted by this negatively. And on the positive side, it's the wealthy bondholders and the major corporations that are benefiting. Uh, so I told you we're going to return to the Fed, and and so we're coming back to the to the Federal Reserve, um, and going to look a little bit more specifically as what the Fed has done. Just this morning, a watchdog um, organization that, that is supposed to look at all these government policies, um, and it was insisted on by Elizabeth Warren. She said we have to have a watchdog agency to figure out where all this money is going. But the government has refused so far to name a chairman, chairperson for this committee, but it's there. Uh, the watchdog says the Fed programs give big corporations a boost. The Federal Reserve and the Treasury Department have given large corporations a bigger lift than smaller businesses or state and local governments, according to their latest assessment. Now, I want to use an extended example, um, uh, is kind of the main last substantive points I want to make um, about. Uh, Something that is greatly needed, but the, which the Federal Reserve um, is uh, only making uh, lip service at providing. And this is support for state and local um, budgets. I, we talked before about how state and local expenditure is so crucial um, for so many things. The Federal Reserve, in nodding its hat to this need, said, okay, we're going to set up a municipal uh, liquidity facility. Uh, to get to lend money not just to corporations and the bondholders, but to state and local governments. Um, but recently, a number of reports have come out which have um, shown that the Federal Reserve Lending Program is falling way short. And in fact, that it was aimed to uh, underachieve, as one group put it. 97% uh, of eligible cities, states, and counties are excluded from the program because the, the Federal Reserve insists on charging too high an interest rate and excessive fees. And this shows that the Fed has a double standard, lending to private corporations on better terms than states, cities, and counties. Now, not only does this, uh, the, do the states and locales uh, play a key role in providing all these services, but um, they too provide uh, a larger share, a, a relatively high share of African-American employment, state and local governments, as in addition to providing all these local services. Now, what could be done so that the Federal Reserve um, could improve and really start providing help to the states um, and locales like Northampton and Massachusetts? Well, luckily, there's been a campaign started to try to pressure the Federal Reserve to do this. And this campaign, um, uh, has a number of, of uh, particular arguments like extend the term to longer period, lower the interest rates, make more places available uh, to get it, et cetera. Um, and so what we need in the future is more and more of these campaigns to get the government to provide the funding uh, that, they, that they need. So now what's next? What's gonna happen? And where should we go from here? Um, well, we don't know. Economists never know what's going to happen. And we don't know, we certainly don't know uh, this time. Uh, but they're saying there are different kinds of econ uh, outcomes. There's going to be the V economy. The economy went down really fast. And Trump says it's going to skyrocket back up. So it's going to be, by the time he's uh, coming up for election, everything's going to be hunky-dory. <coughs> There's the swoosh economy, which is based on this Nike symbol, which kind of goes down rapidly and then slowly goes up. There's the W economy. <coughs> it goes down, then we go up, and then there's another corona crisis, a second wave, and then it goes down again, and then it goes up, and we just keep going like that. And then there's the horizontal hockey stick economy, where it goes down rapidly and then just crawls along the floor for the foreseeable future. Um, 
So what is to be done? Well, as I just suggested, the first thing to be done is to organize, to try to get the government to provide the help that the government should be providing, and uh, including the Federal Reserve. And a number of people have been doing that. But what about the fiscal policy? What about, um, what about uh, the Congress and the presidency? Well, we all know that Trump is holding a rally in Tulsa today, uh, tomorrow, with 19,000 people um, in an arena. And um, apparently they're looking for a new slogan to launch his camp new campaign. So I, I think this is a pretty good slogan. Uh, make America dead again. Um, so that's what I would recommend for the Trump campaign. And for the rest of us, the only thing that we could do and need to do is vote and get out the vote. Thank you very much. And well, before we go to the question and answer period, um, I want to do something that um, none of us like doing much, but it might fit this talk, which is ask for money. Um, Northampton Neighbors um, has no dues, no fees, or charges for any of the services or opportunities we provide because we decided very early on that we wanted to be inclusive. That unlike most villages in the world, and certainly in the United States, that charge a fee, we don't charge a fee because we wanted people, regardless of their economic position, to be able to be members. But we do have expenses, and that means we have to be creative and dogged to find funds to keep the organization going. So we hope you'll make a contribution of any size to help us um, uh, help keep Northampton Neighbors cost free for all of its members by going to Northampton Neighbors, one word, um, dot org and click on donations. You can pay by check, money, um, you can, or PayPal, um, or credit card. Uh, and we'd very much appreciate it. And now we're going to go to questions. And the way we originally were, was going to, were going to do it was that people were going to send their chat questions to me. But if, Jerry, would you rather the chat questions be sent to you? Well, I don't care. However you want to do it. It just seems like it'd be more efficient. I mean, I'm seeing them right here on my screen. So uh, okay. rather than have, it would take less time, I think. But, but before, before we go to the questions that are chat, some people sent in questions beforehand. Okay. Um, and I, let me just ask one of them. And one was, is the, is the economy really doing as well as the president says and the stock market indicates? How good or bad is the outlook? Which I think you addressed in part in your talk. Do you want to add anything? Yeah, so um, the, as, I, as I said in the talk, the, the stock market is being artificially propped up uh, by the Federal Reserve, um, and uh, so it's that's not a measure of how the overall economy is doing. It never really is, but especially not now when the Fed is um, basically giving a, a, a guarantee to the to the stock market and other financial assets. Um, the economy is doing terribly. Uh, it's doing worse than it's done since the Great Depression for most people um, because of uh, the, the cut and pay, the high unemployment and the great risks that people face uh, uh, who have to go to work. So um, no, it's not doing well, and it's certainly not doing as well as President Trump says. Um, I think what people should do when you go to chat is instead of sending your questions to everyone, send them to Jerry. You can click on the person you want to send them to. Um, and another question that was sent is, what is a junk bond and do only very large corporations have them? So a junk bond means uh, uh, a bond that a corporation is selling, that is, it's trying to borrow money, oh. and that for various oh, reasons. Hi. Patrick? Oh, hi. Good. Long time no talk. <laughs> Nina? I think you have to mute yourself. Uh, no, good to hear from you. Joshua, mute yourself. Joshua. Yeah, sure. OK. I just mute. <laughs> <laughs> um, Junk bond. Yeah, so uh, a junk bond is simply mean a, a very risky bond. That is uh, a, a bond that a, that a corporation sells to try to raise money. And it's well known that the corporation is extremely risky. And it's usually because uh, it, it's borrowed a lot of money. So it has a lot of debt. So if there's any downturn in the economy, um, uh, it's going to uh, get into financial trouble, maybe even go bankrupt and won't be able to pay the bond back. Um, and uh, this dovetails with uh, a question 
you know, what kinds of assets is the Federal Reserve buying? And the amazing thing is that um, the Federal Reserve is buying all kinds of uh, assets, except assets that really matter to most people. Um, it's buying uh, junk bonds, either directly or indirectly, other kinds of corporate bonds. Most of what it buys are um, government treasury bonds, uh, um, which drives down government interest rates, which is good in one sense because it reduces the cost that the government has to pay on all the debt it's running us. But it also then indirectly spills over uh, into boosting um, stocks and other assets because when wealthy people see that government debt isn't earning a high interest rate, they shift over and buy some other, uh, some other securities like stocks. Um, the Federal Reserve is lending money to, to banks. It's lending money to uh, other foreign countries, foreign central banks. It's lending money um, to uh, corporations. What it's not doing is lending money at reasonable interest rates to states and local governments or to, um, to school systems, um, to, uh, to black owned businesses, et cetera. Uh, there's a question here, here um, why was the economy really strong before COVID or was it artificially so? So um, the economy was a very mixed picture. It was on a slow recovery ever since 2009 after the financial crisis. And that recovery continued through the Trump period. Um, and he took credit for the whole thing, but of course most of it was under Obama. Um, and what recovered? Well, the unemployment rate went down a lot. Um, it was still not as low as the official numbers said, but it had come down quite a lot. And uh, so from that perspective, um, it was doing uh, well. On the other hand, there are data that show the top one or 5% of the income distribution got you know, 75% of the gains from that long steady recovery. Um, so in that sense, um, no, the economy as a whole was not doing very well. And um, the minimum wage barely rose. Uh, we all know the health insurance crisis, people don't have, didn't have, don't have health insurance, many. So uh, no, the economy was not um, in good shape, but uh, it, it did recover um, steadily and slowly since the 2007, 2009 crisis. Was it artificially propped up? Well, yes, in some senses, the Federal Reserve kept interest rates low that whole time. So asset prices were artificially propped up. So asset prices like stocks and other things were in kind of a bubble. And when the crisis hit, they, those crashed. And now the Federal Reserve has propped them back up again. Um, if the Fed can prop up the stock market, is it not the case that the economy really needs fiscal help? Uh, or while the Fed can prop up the stock market, <clears throat> is it not the case that the economy really needs fiscal help from Congress? Yes, uh, the, um, the economy desperately needs fiscal help from government. Um, I talked about the municipal liquidity facility as a Fed liquidity uh, facility, but they only lend money. What states and locales need is not more debt. Uh, they need to, to get huge uh, uh, revenue sharing subsidies from the federal government in order for them to provide all these services. That's fiscal policy. The healthcare system needs massive amounts of infusion into the healthcare system to keep it operating and providing healthcare for, for everybody. We need uh, <clears throat> massive infusions from the government to uh, pay unemployment insurance um, and benefits for those who uh, have lost their jobs. If not, if they don't get that, then they're going to be forced to go back to work. Uh, the corporations are not going to provide the safe um, working conditions that they need. So it'll be like going back to the 19th century, where they forced uh, people off the land into the, uh, the meatpacking factories. Um, uh, so it was either die or starve. And uh, so unless the, unless the government actually steps up and provides massive help to all these sectors, uh, the Federal Reserve um, can't 
uh, can do much but play a somewhat of a substitute role. Um, and unfortunately, I think we're going to need to change our government for that to happen. Recently, I put all my retirement savings in effectively cash, which will not earn interest, but, uh, but won't lose principal, I think. My plan is to keep it there until after the election and the second wave of COVID is over. Is that a ba bad plan? <laughs> Unfortunately, I cannot give this kind of advice because um, if I could, and if I knew the answer to these things, uh, um, you'd see me in, in a room with chandeliers and lots of books in the behind me, <laughs> Picasso's on the wall. Um, but no, I'm in this little, I'm in this little cram space here with nothing uh, to go for it. So no, I'm sorry, I cannot give uh, financial advice. Um, uh, whether that's a good plan or not, I, I wish I, I wish I could. Let's see. Um, what What I really want to know is what to do with my IRA. I wish I could help you. I really wish I could help you. Um, so. Uh, does Federal Reserve policy just amount to printing money? Uh, yes, it, it essentially does, and, but there are different ways that it, it could do that. One is it could um, print money and use it to lend money, to buy up debt, to lend money. Um, and that's what it's uh, mostly been doing, to banks, to the government, corporations, et cetera. But it could do something else, which some people are now are increasingly saying it should do. Um, it could print up the money and then just give it uh, direct payments. Um, so for example, um, the uh, $1,200 payments it gave to households, uh, the treasury put up the mon money for that, um, but the Federal Reserve could just print it um, and, and print it up and send it to them. Now, some people call this uh, helicopter money, some people call this direct payments. The problem with lending the money is that it keeps building up private debt um, that people owe and the governments owe. Um, so I think there's been an increased interest in the idea of direct payment by, by the Federal Reserve. And, and we might see that happening more and more as this continues. Uh, what else? Um, I think, I think uh, um, there, hmm. I think now we should unmute. We what, what we what we tend to do is do chats, and then we unmute, and people can raise hands. And sure. I think Bill Sweet just William Sweet just raised his hand. I don't see him. Yeah, that's me, Bill. Oh, there hey, you are. Yeah, uh, Jerry, uh, why don't you address that question Barbara raised before she left? Why aren't we giving businesses money to employ workers the way countries like Germany are? Yeah, this has been a big debate. Um, Germany uh, has a system where they directly give uh, money uh, to workers. So what you what you uh, don't see in Germany is a big increase in the unemployment rate because workers effectively um, have stayed on the job in the sense of being paid, uh, but they're not actually going to work and doing anything. Um, and uh, um, I think the the main reason why we didn't do that is because there was so much opposition from the Republicans who uh, didn't want to make many payments to workers at all. This gets back to the point I made before about going back to the 19th century. Um, they're worried that giving payments to workers is going to disincentivize them from going to work out uh, in the factories and the meatpacking companies and, and, and so hotels and so forth. And they want to cut back on these kinds of social supports. So uh, like the 19th and 18th century uh, workers in England and um, uh, during the enclosure movements were thrown off the land, had to go into the satanic mills uh, that Marx described um, because they were faced with a, an issue of starvation versus um, versus uh, his work and um, in, in very unpleasant and unhealthy circumstances. Essentially, that's what the Republicans are trying to do. That's what they mean by opening up. When they say, let's open up, 
what they also say is we're cutting all these supports and we're forcing people to go back to work. And this was um, an issue that they raised right from the very beginning. And so they wanted to have um, very little in the way of direct payments to workers. Anybody else have a question? I can't really see the whole screen, so any more hands? We while well, we got him here. Yeah, Mark, I think has a hand. Mark, unmute yourself. Ah, uh, here. Okay. Unmuted. Unmuted. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, no, Mark. Yeah. So uh, you had a slide that you skipped over of Marx versus Kane. What were you going to say? Oh, okay. <laughs> It's related to the last point. It actually said uh, Marx versus Keynes plus Anthony Fauci. So um, Marx said uh, that uh, the way capitalism grew and developed in the 19th century is you threw people off the land, you forced them into the factories, they were exploited and made a lot of profits for, for businesses, and the businesses reinvested this money uh, in, in factories and the economy grew. Um, and that's uh, the idea that Trump and the Republicans have. That's what they think is going to happen now. But in the 1930s, Keynes came in and said that, oops, um, if you pay workers, uh, you know, basement wages and they all die on the in the factory floor, who's going to buy all this stuff uh, that you're, um, you're producing? And then Anthony Fauci comes in and says, yeah, and they're, they're not going to buy this stuff if they're not going to go to hotels, they're not going to go on airplanes, they're not going to go on trips, uh, they're not going to go to restaurants because they're worried about getting the COVID-19 and dying. So um, that's why, in my view, uh, Trump and Marx, it's kind of ironic that Trump is, you know, Marxian. Trump and Marx um, are not going to win this time. It's more likely to be Keynes and Fauci and uh, we're likely to see more like a hockey stick kind of economy until there's a vaccine, um, is my guess. Uh, here's another question, unmute. Uh, can you unmute yourself? I just did. Oh, good. Um, what about these alternatives? Um, Cleveland, Cincinnati, and the Rust Belt have turned that whole situation around with co-ops and localized economies. Um, we call it the new economy. Um, Washington, D.C. is going to go left, going to go right. Um, it's politically uh, motivated. Um, how about some of these other ideas? What, what, what does that fit in with uh, an economist like yourself? That's a great question. Um, so uh, I think what we have to do is uh, create the, the environment and the supports for uh, financial and other cooperative institutions like those, um, rather than for the big banks and the, uh, and the Wall Street banks that the Fed is bailing out. So I'm working with some groups that are trying to help su support um, and develop public banking um, and trying to promote that the Federal Reserve support these kinds of, of um, initiatives uh, because they need the same kinds of financial support that the banks have. They need uh, some expertise, they need some lines of credit, they need some capital equity infusions, they need essentially a banker's bank. And the Federal Reserve is an institution that could do that. So um, I think we're only gonna get rid of our dependence on Wall Street who keeps crashing our economy every 10 years or so if we build up these alternative institutions. But it's hard to build them up just on a case-by-case -case basis. You need some broader infrastructure to help support them. Like we had in the Great Depression, we had uh, the Reconstruction Finance Corporation that was set up ironically first under Hoover, but then it was Roosevelt who really developed it. And they helped um, underwrite a lot of these kinds of innovative ideas uh, during that time. And we need that again. Bill, do you have another question? You have your hand is on your. No, my hand didn't go away. I don't know why. <laughs> okay. Um, 
Anybody else? We're, we're, we've got only a few minutes left. So if you have another questions, now's the time to ask it. Oh, let's see. There's something, are the $1,200 checks just an advance on tax refunds? No, uh, they are a standalone payment um, to individuals and the, the $500 per child that you might get. Uh, they're not an advance, they're just a standalone uh, payment. You don't have to pay those back. You'll still get your tax refund. And have they served to stimulate the economy? Well, yes and no. Um, they went to every, you know, well, they went to everybody with an income below 100,000 or so. And uh, so, yeah, they, they provided some stimulus because people had to had, uh, spent it, they didn't save it. Uh, and we could use more of that, but um, what, uh, what seemed to work better was the $600 extra un uh, unemployment insurance and the unemployment insurance that was extended to gig workers and others didn't, didn't have access to it, to it before. By the way, I didn't mention all the support that um, the care sector needs. I'm looking at Naomi now, and definitely should have mentioned that. I mean, that's an example of a, a sector that needs lots of support and lots of help. Um, from, from the government and just like state and local government, um, the, the feds aren't providing it. Will we be taxed on that uh, $1,200? Um, that's a good question. I don't think so. I don't think you will. Mark, you need to unmute. Mark. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Um, so I forget if you said it was Germany or Scandinavia, but they're paying workers, so their unemployment is lower. And we've now given these, you know, checks to people, um, not in advance on taxes. Does that mean that Andrew Yang's ideas during the campaign were better than they were given credit for? Well, I think the idea of uh, a uniform basic income and just giving people money uh, certainly makes sense in a crisis like this. And it may also make sense uh, in the face of high unemployment due to automation and so forth, which is what he was worried about. Uh, the major, a major problem that some people argue about that is that it's hard to make meaningful. I mean, $1,200, even $1,200 a month, yeah. um, isn't that meaningful for that many people. Yeah. Um, but uh, I think um, as if unemployment stays high, if, if the um, recovery from the, the COVID crisis is, is slow uh, and, uh, um, and so I think this idea of a, of a uniform of a, a basic income, like Andrew Yang was talking about, is going to gain currency, and we're likely to see more of it. Thank you. I think we have we might have time for one. Uh, Marsha, you're the last question. <laughs> okay. Um, so July 31st is not that far away, and there are slews of people who aren't going to be getting that $600 every week that they're getting right now. Do you have any sense of what that's going to look like? Yeah, going back to the satanic factory, the satanic mill. I mean, what are these people going to do? Um, they're going to have to choose between. Gary? I can't hear you. <laughs> oh. You're muted. Sorry. Can you hear me now? So it's going to be like what I was talking about. They're going to have to make these terrible choices. They're going to have to go work uh, for companies that might not uh, provide them protection or it might not be safe. Uh, because they're not going to have any alternative. And this is the strategy, the Trump Republican strategy for quote unquote, opening up and getting the economy going again. So but I'm there will be enough jobs in the economy for all of those people? Well, if Keynes and Fauci are right, uh, no, there won't be. 
because the demand isn't coming back. Um, and so then uh, the Republicans perhaps Hi. are going to have to listen to the Democrats and um, and uh, extend those benefits. So it's going to be like a game of chicken. And um, I can't predict how this game of chicken is going to come out. Yeah. It's going to be between Trump and Marx on the one hand and uh, Fauci and Keynes on the other. And I don't know who's going to who's going to win. That's probably a very good note to end on. Thank you so much, Jerry. Thank you. Thank you. I think Nina's going to put it up a, 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 a ending chart. <laughs> okay. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very Thank much. You, for Jerry. Bye. Thank you. Bye.